Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 28, verses 12 and 13. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Burkett notes, Immediately, that is, one, after his baptism, Christ is no sooner out of the water of baptism, but he is in the fire of temptation. Such as are baptized with Christ and entered into the profession of Christianity must look to be assaulted with Satan's temptations. Again, immediately, that is, two, after the Father had declared his complacency in him and being well pleased with him. Learn, thence the great manifestations of love from God are usually followed with great temptations from God. The Spirit driveth him, that is, the Holy Spirit of God, for the devil is seldom if ever called the Spirit, but usually some brand of approach is annexed as the evil spirit or the unclean spirit and the like. Christ was led by the Spirit, says St. Matthew, chapter 4, 1. He was driven by the Spirit, says St. Mark, that is, he was carried by a strong impulse of the Spirit of God to be tempted by Satan and did not go of his own private motion to enter the lists with Satan, teaching us our duty not to run into or rush upon temptations without a warrant or a call from God. Observe next the place where Satan assaulted Christ with his temptations. It was a solitary wilderness. No place can privilege us from temptations or be a sanctuary from Satan's assaults. The solitary wilderness has a temper in it. Yea, Satan oftentimes makes use of men's solitariness to further his temptations. And such as separate themselves from human society and give themselves up to solitude and retirement give great advantage to the tempter to tempt them. Observe next the time and continuance of our Holy Lord's temptations, not for an hour, a day, a week, or a month, but for forty days and forty nights, not all the time, but very often in that time, teaching us that what we are to expect from Satan, temptations, not a few, he will not solicit us once, but often, and follow us with fresh assaults. But the only way to overcome is as often to resist him. Observe farther, a special aggravation of our Lord's temptations in the wilderness, he was with the wild beasts, having no comfort from man, but only wild beasts for his companions which were more likely to annoy and hurt him than any way to help and comfort him. Here we have evidence of the divine power of Christ, who, as Lord of the creatures, can alter and change the nature of the creature at his pleasure, restraining the most savage and hurtful beasts from hurting either himself or any of his people. Observe lastly the supply sent to Christ in the hour of temptation. The angels came and ministered unto him, food to his hungry body and comfort to his tempted soul. Learn thence that those who in the hour of temptation do hold out in resisting Satan shall find the power and faithfulness of God will not be wanting to them to send in succor and relief at last. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Verses 14 and 15. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Burkett notes, In this, our Savior's first beginning to preach the gospel, we have an account of the time when, the place where, and the sum of what he preached. Observe 1, the time when our Lord began to preach, and that was after John the Baptist was cast into prison, where note 1, the undue reward which the ministers of God do sometimes meet with from a wicked world. They are hated, persecuted, and imprisoned for their courage in reproving sin. John, for reproving Herod's incest, was put in prison. Note 2. John was no sooner in prison and stopped and hindered from preaching, but Christ began to preach. See the care and kindness of God towards his church, and that he never leaves it wholly destitute of the means of instruction. When some of his faithful ministers are restrained from preaching, he stirreth up others in their room, not suffering all their mouths to be stopped at once. Observe, too, the place where our Lord first preached, in Galilee. The land of Canaan in our Savior's time was divided into three principal provinces. On the south, Judea. On the north, Galilee. In the midst, Samaria. Galilee was divided into upper and lower Galilee. 
The higher was called Galilee of the Gentiles, because it was the utmost part of the land, and so next to the Gentiles. In this upper Galilee, Capernaum was the metropolis, or chief, and Chorazin, a lesser city. Now much of our Savior's time was spent in Galilee. He was conceived and brought up in Nazareth, a city in Galilee. He first preached at Capernaum in Galilee. He wrought his first miracles at Canaan in Galilee. His transfiguration was upon Mount Tabor in Galilee, and our Savior's ordinary residence was in Galilee. He came into Judea and up to Jerusalem only at the feasts, and after his resurrection he appoints his disciples to meet him in Galilee. Only his nativity, his passion, and ascension were proper to Judea, his nativity at Bethlehem, his passion at Jerusalem, and his ascension upon Mount Olive, hard by Jerusalem. Now all this demonstrates Christ to be the true and promised Messiah. For according to the prophecy, the Messiah was to have his presence and principal abode in the province of Galilee. Isaiah 9, 1, 2, 3, etc. Yet because he was of Galilee, the Jews would not believe him to be the Messiah, saying in scorn, Can any good thing come out of Galilee? Whereas our Savior's habitation and free conversation there was a proof unto them, and ought to have persuaded them that according to the prophecy, he was the very Christ. Observe 3, the sum of what our Lord preached, namely a doctrine and an exhortation. His doctrine is that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. That is, that the time foretold by the prophets, when the kingdom of the Messiah should begin, was now come. The exhortation is, therefore repent and believe the gospel. From the former note, that the Messiah's coming, or our Savior's appearing in the flesh, was exactly at the time foretold by the holy prophets. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of the Messiah is at hand. Note, too, that the great doctrines of repentance and faith are taught only in and by the gospel, and accordingly ought, in a special manner, to be preached and insisted upon by the ministers of the gospel. The doctrine of Christ and his ambassadors is and ought to be the same, they both teach the great doctrine of faith and repentance to a lost world. Repent and believe the gospel. Verses 16 through 20. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him. Burkett notes, In this history of our Savior's calling the four disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John, observe these particulars. 1. The meanness of the persons whom he calls illiterate fishermen. Christ took hereby effectual care that his gospel should be known to be the power of God and not the wisdom and device of man, and that the instrument should not carry away the glory of the work. Observe, too, Christ called his apostles by couples, two and two, first Peter and Andrew, then James and John thereby signifying to us that the work of the ministry requires the concurrence of all hands that are called to it. All the ministers of God should join their hearts and hands and set their shoulders as one man to this great work, and all little enough, God knows, to carry it on with advantage and success. Observe 3. The work which they are called from and called to, from being fishermen to being fishers of men, from catching fish with the labor of their hands to catch men with the labor of their tongues. Observe 4. Our Savior's command. First to follow him before they be sent out by him. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We must be Christ's disciples before we are his ministers, his followers before we are his ambassadors. We must learn Christ before we preach him. Otherwise, we may fish for a livelihood, but not for souls. Observe 5 the gracious promise which Christ gives his apostle for their encouragements, namely, to qualify them for and to succeed them in their offices. I will make you fishers of men. Faithfulness and care, diligence and endeavor is our part, but the blessing and success is Christ's. Our labor is only in the cast. 
Christ's power is holy in the draft. Some fish cleave to the rocks, others play upon the sands, more wallow in mud. And verily, we shall labor all our days and catch nothing, if Christ do not bring our fish to the net and enclose them in it, as well as assist us in throwing and casting of it. Observe 6. The Apostles' ready compliance with our Savior's call. Straightway they forsook their fathers and friends, ship and nets, and followed Jesus. Whom Christ calls, he calls effectually, and draws whom he calls, and works their heart to a ready compliance with their duty. Observe 7. That upon their call to the ministry, they leave off their trade. They forsake their ship and nets, and lie close to their ministerial employment, teaching us that the ministers of the gospel should wholly give themselves up to their great work, and not encumber themselves with secular affairs and worldly business. Nothing but an indispensable necessity in providing for a family can excuse a minister's encumbering himself with worldly concerns and business. Verses 21 and 22. And they went into Capernaum, and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. Burkett notes, Our Savior, having called his disciples, Peter and Andrew, James and John, to follow him in order to their preaching of the gospel, here we may observe how he went himself along with them, teaching personally in the synagogues wherever he came. He did not send his apostles forth as his curates and lay at home himself upon his couch of ease. What should we say to those lazy fishermen that set others out to the drag but care only to feed themselves with the fish, not willing to wet their hands with the net or take any pains themselves? Our Savior did not thus, but when he sent forth his apostles, he still preached himself. He went into their synagogues and taught, Observe farther the success of his preaching. The people were astonished at his doctrine, struck with admiration, apprehending and believing him to be an extraordinary prophet sent from God. Learn hence that such is the efficacy of Christ's doctrine, especially when accompanied with the energy and operation of his Holy Spirit, that it makes all his auditors admirers, causing astonishment in their mind and reformation in their manners. Observe lastly the reason of our Lord's success in preaching. He taught as one having authority. He taught in his own name, as being Lord of his doctrine, not saying with the prophets, Thus saith the Lord, but I say unto you. And he wrought powerful miracles, which accompanied his doctrine, as Christ was careful to preserve the authority of his person and doctrine with the people. So it is the duty of his ministers to demean themselves amongst their people, that neither their authority may be contempted nor their persons despised, but their doctrine and themselves reverenced and obeyed. Verses 23 through 27. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Burkett notes, St. Mark, having given an account of our Savior's doctrine which he preached, verse 15, namely, the doctrine of faith and repentance. He now acquaints us in the remaining part of this chapter with the miracles which he wrought for the confirming of his doctrine, and they are three. First, the casting of a devil out of one possessed, verse 23. Secondly, the curing of Peter's wife's mother of fever, verse 29. Thirdly, the cleansing of the leper, from verse 40 to the end of the chapter. His first miracle was the casting a devil out of one possessed. There was a man with an unclean spirit. That is, an unclean spirit did enter into him and bodily possess him. Amongst the many calamities which sin has brought upon our bodies, this is one, that we are liable to be bodily possessed by Satan. The devil has an inveterate malice against mankind, seeking to ruin our souls by his suggestion and temptations, and to destroy our bodies by some means or other. But blessed be God, though his malice be infinite, yet his power is limited and bounded. 
as he cannot do all the mischief he would, so he shall not do all he can. Oh, how much is it our interest as well as our duty by prayer to put ourselves morning and evening under the divine protection that we may be preserved from the power and malice of evil spirits. Observe, too, the attribute or title given to the devil. He is called an unclean spirit. The devils, those wicked spirits of hell, are most impure and filthy creatures, impure by means of their original apostasy, impure by means of their actual and daily sins, such as murder, malice, lying, and the like, by which they continually pollute themselves, impure by means of their continual desire and endeavor to pollute mankind with the contagion of their own sin. Lord, how foul is the nature of sin which makes the devil such a foul and unclean creature. Observe 3. The unclean spirit no sooner saw Christ, but he cried out. Whence note that the greatness of Christ's power, being the Son of God, over devils and wicked spirits, is such that it is very terrible and tormenting to them. It was terrible to them in his state of humiliation on earth, and made them then cry out. But oh, how terrible will his power be to them at the great day, when Christ shall come in flaming fire to render vengeance both to men and devils. Observe 4. The substance of the devil's outcry. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Art thou come to destroy us? Where note, that though the devils are now as full of sin and discontent as they can be, yet they are not so full of misery and torment as they shall be. Art thou come to torment us before the time? Says St. Matthew, chapter 8, 29. Art thou come to destroy us? Says St. Mark. That is, to bring upon our full and final destruction implying that the devil has not yet his full judgment and complete damnation. Therefore, there is certainly a day of judgment to come, and the devils are in chains of darkness, reserved to the judgment of that great day. But some by these words, Art thou come to destroy us, understand as much as Art thou come to restrain us from the exercise of our power. Learn we thence that the devil thinks himself destroyed when he is restrained from doing mischief. Observe 5. The title which the devil put upon our Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. Although there was ground for the common people's calling Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, because he was bred and brought up there, and lived there during his private life, till about thirty years of age, though he was not born there, but at Bethlehem, yet it is conceived that the devil gave this title to our Savior in policy, to disguise the place of Christ's nativity so that the Jews might not believe him to be the true Messiah, because he was of Nazareth, where the Messiah was to come out of Bethlehem. Therefore, to the intent that the Jews might be at the greater loss concerning Christ, and in doubt of his being the true Messiah, the devil here calls him not Jesus of Bethlehem, but Jesus of Nazareth. But how comes the next title out of the devil's mouth, the Holy One of God? Could an apostle, could Peter himself, make a profession beyond this? But how comes the devil to make it? For no good end or purpose we may be sure, for he never speaks the truth for truth's sake, but for advantage. Probably, one, he made this profession so that he might bring the truth professed into suspicion, hoping that a truth which received testimony from the father of lies would be suspected. Two, it might perhaps be done that the people might believe that our Savior had some familiarity with Satan, and did work miracles by his help, because he did confess him, and seemed so much to honor him. From this instance and example learn that it is possible for a person to own and acknowledge Christ to be the true and only Savior, and yet to miss of salvation by him. If a speculative knowledge and a verbal profession of Christ were sufficient to salvation, the devil himself would not miss of happiness. Observe 6. How our Savior rebukes the devil for his confession, and commands him silence. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace. But why was this rebuke given the devil when he spake the truth? Answer 1. Because Christ knew that the devil confessed this truth on purpose to disgrace the truth. 2. Because the devil was no fit person to make this profession. A testimony of truth from the father of lies is enough to render truth itself suspected. Yet the devil's evidence that Christ was the Holy One of God will rise up in judgment against the wicked Pharisees, who shut their eyes against the miracles and stop their ears against the doctrine of the Holy One of God. Observe lastly how the unclean spirit obeys the voice of Christ, though with great reluctance and regret. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out. 
Christ is Lord over the wicked angels and has an absolute power and authority to overrule them and command them at his pleasure. If Christ says to the evil spirit, come out, out he must come. Yet observe the devil's spite at parting. He tears the man, tortures his body, throws him violently from place to place, showing how loath he was to be dispossessed. Where Satan has once gotten a hold and settled himself for a time, how unwilling is he to be cast out of possession. Ye, it is a torture and vexation to him to be cast out. It is much easier to keep him out than to cast him out. Satan may possess the body by God's permission, but he cannot possess our hearts without our own consent and approbation. It will be our wisdom to deny him entrance into our souls at first by rejecting his wicked motions and suggestions. For when once entered, he will, like the strong man armed, keep the house till a stronger than he casts him out. Verse 28 and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region around about Galilee.